Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello, and welcome to A Better Peace. I'm Jacqueline Whit, and I'm the War Room Editor-in-Chief, and you're listening to the third and final installment of our three-part roundtable podcast, in which my guests and I take a tour through the theory of war and strategy, and are thinking about how that might be applied in the real world. So on the podcast, we have three guests. First is Colonel Tino Perez, who is on the faculty at the U.S. Army War College, an Army strategist, and a political theorist. Second is Andrew Hill, who's the founding editor of War Room and my predecessor as editor-in-chief. And finally, we have Emily Knowles, who is the director of the Remote Warfare Program with the Oxford Research Group. So back in the second episode, Tino had just sort of left off asking us to think about, to imagine, what a major war with a peer competitor might actually look like. And he asserted that there was no way it would end cleanly. And so we want to think in this episode about how that might affect how we think of the nature of war about politics and the problems of war termination. So join us now for the final part of our conversation. The benefit that we've, got, you know, that we've had since 9-11 in 2003 has been an attention that these social political, uh, the landscape matters to war. And my worry is that we're gonna forget about it. And if we envision war with a peer competitor, you can pick, you know who they are. And it actually happens, God forbid. There's no way that war ends cleanly. Uh, that's an, that's a fascinating point, right? You you raise a great point, which is, yeah, imagine imagine a conflict, a, a real a real war with China over something in the South China Sea or whatever. What does war termination yeah. look like in in mm-hmm. that environment? And right now, this this shift in focus to lethality to me almost reflects a desire not not to return to the good old days, right? But but to something that is more. Uh, more confined or sort of more strictly. Where the boundaries are, are yeah, clearer. Yeah, the, the boundaries are clearer. They're tighter. We have way more control over that because we don't have to think about politics. But you never don't have to think about politics. And I think this is, World War II is such a great example of this because it feels that the end of that war feels almost as clean as any you can imagine. There's state death in Germany and Japan. Um, and the the task is to rebuild those societies almost from the ground up. And it's still enormously complicated. They've been thinking about it since 1942. Um, and the, the challenges are are enormous. And I think like that, that the, all of the green books are really great, but that one is particularly excellent for, for talking about these issues um and this lethality question right once the once the killing is done once the breaking you know breaking things down kicking down doors and killing bad guys is finished the what comes next question is is so important and this is one of the concerns i have with this lethality the move toward focusing on lethality which would suggest that somehow the U.S. military isn't good at yeah. killing people. And or hasn't really thought and about I, it. all I think is like, <laughs> oh, I don't think that's the problem. Like, no. You're plenty lethal, you're, you, right? You're getting more precise. You've got, you've got capabilities to do that. And we have to talk about readiness and training and modernization and all of that. Absolutely. Um, but it's always the political questions that are tricky. And you screw up the political in World War II, and the Marshall Plan doesn't look like it does. The establishment of Western Europe as a sort of economic uh, powerhouse, as uh, a sort of beacon for the four freedoms and all of that, doesn't it doesn't look the same if you screw up the political end to the Second World War. Um, so there's this interesting kind of thought experiment that, I, that I'm fond of when thinking about artificial intelligence in war, because this is something I'm thinking about a lot these days. And it has to do with... Uh, imagining that you have like this amazingly capable, artificially intelligent, fully autonomous sort of combat system, system of killer systems, right? And and you've managed to create something in which no humans are actually involved in any aspect of the war fighting, you know? Where do the robots start? And where do they end, right? Like, where in the story of this conflict do they do they start their work? 
and where do they have to stop? And and I'll, my view is that is that they can do pretty much everything except tell you that you should go to war because that has to be a kind of that's a political decision. Yeah. Like the robots will be like Jackie, it is time to attack. I mean, obviously they're not going to talk like that, but you know. I hope they do. <laughs> I really <laughs> hope that they yeah. do. It'd That'd be, be so much more fun. Beady beady beady. <laughs> Sorry, buck. But but the uh so so they're they're not going to tell you that it's that it's time to go to war. And they're also not actually going to tell you that oh, hey, it's time to stop fighting and and sort of turn this into some kind of sustainable political advantage. The the ro- killer robots are not going to be like running kind of the transition to politics, uh, the better peace, you know, that that little heart talks about, right? Like they have to there has to be human involvement in those transitional spaces. Well, let me complicate that just a little bit. Uh Oh, you are you're, an academic. You're painting a picture where there's politics at the beginning and the politics at the end, and you need humans at both instances. The rest can be. Well, no, I was mechanical. just saying the minimum, like sort of. I was sort of saying, hey, what's the largest possible space for them? But go ahead. No, yeah. so, so now we go back and we drop on Clausewitz, and we talk about the international Boom. relations theory of interstate war as opposed to civil war, which I was emphasizing before. Mm-hmm. And interstate war uh, IR theory is is really dealing with lots of questions you, that you do see in Thucydides. That war is never by itself, that it's always war and bargaining and negotiations together. And you're always learning about what happens on the battlefield. And you see this with Thucydides, and we're not really paying attention to it now. Yeah, that battles give you information, that fighting gives you information. And your war aims change through your experiences in battle. And you want them to. If you start it, if you you have, and I think this is... This is a thing we see with our students too. Is right, they want clearly defined objectives and mm-hmm. end states, and they they crave that. And at the same time, the number of wars that I can think of where the end state is exactly the same as where it started, it, I I can't think of any. So, so let me ask you a question that allows you to illustrate that. So Afghanistan, there have been some pieces recent, written written recently about how. We're, we've lost or, you know, this is a f- defeat or whatever. Jackie, if I said, Jackie, I need you to describe this, the U.S. exit from Afghanistan in a way that characterizes it as a U.S. victory. Could you do it? Sure. Can you that's, take, that's a shot, my, take a shot take a shot at short, it, right? My short answer, which is that it, well, maybe not. No, because I don't like saying things that are victories. <laughs> I'm make you edit no, but I'm putting you out. in a position of like, sort of, you're the po- you're the policy person crafting this speech that's like describing what we've done there and saying, hey, you know, we've we've achieved what we wanted, and we're going home. You know, so you can't do it. I don't know. You're pretty creative. I'm working on it. Hold we on. take we could take the Vietnamization approach to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, where it's, right where there's a there's a government in Afghanistan that isn't the Taliban. That's not the Taliban. And we're going home. See, I actually think we could characterize it as a victory, even accepting the possibility that the Taliban Taliban comes back into power. Well, sure. If you go, you know, what we wanted to achieve was a commitment that Afghanistan would never again be a safe haven for Al-Qaeda so that another 9-11 couldn't be planned and operated out of Afghan territory. So you just go back to a more limited version of like the reason for your original intervention. Now, I know that's not very attractive. To the I mean, US I th- because to, to, to me, the m- the more the more likely scenario is not that we declare victory and go home, but we acknowledge that in the intervening seventeen years or eighteen years now, um, whatever however long it is, that the um, that the that the objectives have changed, and that we're not we're not going for sort of fully democratized, independent, free, and stable. Afghanistan um but it but we're going to keep Afghanistan manageable right, right? a lid we and, just want, want some and, kind and of a we'll, lid we'll on come there. back in and sort of swoop in with American firepower or boots on the ground or whatever is required in order to keep to keep it at a sort of low simmer and to keep it from boiling over but then it's an interesting one but that's like, a pretty sucky thing yeah, I mean, it's a very narrow reduction of what we've done over the last 18 years, for sure. Uh, but it, it harks back to an interesting point that when we were speaking to our mili- in our military roundtables about, you know, 
how do we characterize whether you know what we're currently seeing is an effective approach to conflict in places like Afghanistan. People were saying, well, what you have to understand is that the first phases of that operation in 2001 were super effective. What we wanted to do was very narrow. We wanted to push al-Qaeda um, back from the areas that it were controlling. We wanted to send a real message to the Taliban leadership at the time that we wouldn't tolerate their harboring of al-Qaeda. You had the Special Forces operation and the Northern Alliance operation basically pushing al-Qaeda out of a lot of the areas that it was controlling. Um, and everyone was like, and that and that was that was good. The moment that it got complicated was that we decided that we wanted more than that. And this is exactly Jackie's point about like the end state changes and our expectation of what it is that we're trying to achieve changes. I mean, you can never go back in time and say if we'd withdrawn at that point right. and we would yeah, have we sent can't a clear message. And, and, you know, there would still have been a Taliban government, but Al-Qaeda wouldn't have been able to operate. We can never know those things. But what we can say is the moment that we decided that the objective of that mission was now regime change and it was going to be pushing the Taliban from power in Kabul, that comes with a whole other set of aims and responsibilities that, that far outstrips like those narrow yeah. goals. And it's so, changed our options yeah. now. Mm. So because we can't roll back the clock, because we can't go back in time, um the actions that that the United States and its coalition has taken over the last 17 years have affected the strategic options that it has available. So the options that may have been available in late 2002 are no longer viable. And so maybe now the the maybe the best you get is it sucks a little less today than it did yesterday. Mm. Um, and you keep you keep a sort of um, you keep a lid on it. But that that's a really, really unattractive strategy to try to sell yeah politically um, to try to sell which of those gains are, are, are irreversible now i think this is one of the really interesting questions when you look at the amount of time resource the amount of lives that the international coalition has lost on that territory the amount of lives that the afghan national defense and security forces have lost um and you go, is that proportionate then? Is is what we're saying that we're going to revert back to these narrow aims and we're going to say, well, we've, we've succeeded because the Taliban have signed a piece of paper that says that they're not going to harbor al-Qaeda anymore. And you go, well, okay. But then we also launched an 18-year campaign yeah. in which we involved at various points over 100,000 NATO troops in trying to stabilize an entire country. And the territorial rollback from that and the actual, you know, what what is irreversible? The gains in women's rights are not irreversible. The gains in the Afghan national government's control over its territory are not irreversible. Any gains that have been made by the Afghan national army are not irreversible either. So you kind of go, well, you know, you, you can paint this as a success if you take a very kind of narrow idea of what the military aspects of that operation were supposed to achieve but this is just another example of how drawing those lines around military goals military strategy mm -hmm. can can be used and abused to kind of go well we've we've achieved the basic principles right we get this a lot you know well we've pushed back isis well we've pushed back al-qaeda well we've pushed back al-shabaab and you kind of go well you sort of have and you sort of haven't i mean territory kind of fluctuates sometimes they're gaining more sometimes they're gaining less um, but does that really ju does that justify the the length and the duration and the intensity of these campaigns over over a period of time? And, and when you're linking that back to your strategy, we very rarely say that you know our strategic interest in engaging in this country is purely you know we want to degrade ISIS. There will always be an overarching strategy that says you know Iraq's security is pivotal for the security of its region. We don't want to see an unstable Iraq and Syria. Um, our own F uh, like our foreign office strategies were very much all about you know trying to get better security sector reform in 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 Iraq, trying to fix some of the fragmentation of um, of Iraqi defense and security to really enable them to to have a more productive defense and security sector to provide security there. And you kind of go well, you know we we always say that the, this is the bar. We set the bar very high when we're talking about what it is that we're trying to achieve in these locations and we do a lot of kind of very narrow military counterterrorism activity and then we try and semantically link the two things in terms of success and failure on objectives and it doesn't really work it, it doesn't sit very well either claiming that we've been successful because a certain group has been pushed back out of a certain area whereas you look at a place like iraq now and all of the fragmentation there or even syria or libya and you go well you know could it, was that the strategy? Can we say that this has been helpful? 
Yeah, I mean, I, and my question wasn't meant to suggest that that idea of, you know, s- s- sort of pitching this as a victory, right, is satisfying in some kind of fundamental way, that it, would, that it would satisfy our sense of justice given what we've poured into the war as a nation or what our allies have put in or what the Afghan people have suffered throughout the war. And, and yet, uh, at the same time, a 17 and a half at this point, 17 and a half year commitment isn't a reason to continue. You know, that's the flip side. Uh, but more fundamentally, I think it is useful to recognize that there is like this creative space. I mean, that's what Tina was describing is, is this cre- creative space before, during and after conflict and making sense of what's going on. I mean, the other great example is keeping Hirohito in power in Japan. Yeah. After the Second World War, I mean, that was that was a stretch for a lot of Americans who had, and I imagine British soldiers and you know other soldiers of the Commonwealth who had suffered in Japanese prison camps, uh, you know, and yet we we did that. There was a sort of creative political exercise in saying, oh, you know, he's not really responsible for for what happened, and you know, we've taken care of the leaders who who were primarily behind it and so on and so forth. But I mean, it is a fact that Hirohito was part of the, I mean, he had to be part of the war party. Yeah, And these are fundamentally, like you said, sort of human questions and the, it gets back to narratives and it gets back to how we tell ourselves and make meaning for ourselves uh, when, when we're at war and when we're executing sort of strategic level questions. A lot of the literature uh, on IR game theoretical uh, approaches to interstate war they're stylized and you could say well this isn't realistic at all but they're pointing the students to very important questions about what are your interests what do you want to achieve and what are your costs and then what are the adversaries and then you have a bargaining space yeah. those are key questions that I don't think we can answer CJ uh, CJ uh, Chivers talked about this on the Modern War Institute podcast but he said we don't know what our strategy is what our aims are in Afghanistan and if you don't know that then how can you engage in this negotiation? And but, if you're not willing to have real conversations about resources and costs and what are acceptable costs and acceptable risk, you can never find the bargaining space. Yeah. And here's where the political enters again uh, today, and we're not thinking about it. We're talking about potential wars, you know, God forbid, again, with Iran, North Korea, Russia, China. They're the same names in the U.S. context that come up all the time. But we're not talking about what are the political drivers that would start off any potential war? What would be the objectives? Because those would then define what are the capabilities you need in terms of equipment and how you train your soldiers. These are questions we're not asking. We're just vaguely envisioning war with these big powers. But you need those. Because at one end, do you envision taking over, say, you know, this is totally hypothetical, I hope, you know, say you fight Russia. Are you going to take over Russia and the government? Or is Russia going to take over the United States? Well, say you say no, and then you back it off from there. What are your aims? Yeah, and that has that's going to determine what kind of weapon systems you need. And, and well, and with to use a China example, right? So we'll get them all in there, right? A war with China as an adversary over a flare up in the South China Sea. My guess is that looks really different from a war that involves China that breaks out on the Korean Peninsula or on the Chinese sort of mainland. So these are, the, the aims are going to look different. The capabilities are going to look different. So just envisioning war with China doesn't actually, yeah. I think, get us very far. We've got to think about over what and for what, for what reasons. What do we want out and of it? And I think it? that's a really valuable point as well, because we do tend to fall um, in the UK space as well into, into the trap of kind of defining these near peer adversaries as kind of your most dangerous threats. And you kind of go, okay, well, they're the most dangerous and therefore we need to sort out our major war fighting capabilities. We're all thinking tanks, armored vehicles, uh, missile systems, uh, confronting Russia in the Baltics. Like that, that's the sort of uh, scenario that gets, that, that gets brought to mind. That you're absolutely right that where, where and how you confront, if you confront any of these actors, is, is actually almost more important than, than who they are. And we see this now with conversations about about Russia and how Russia's been operating in Syria, for example. Are we set up to operate in an environment where we've got another major power operating in the same environment as us, supporting a different side in a conflict, 
can we de-conflict? Do and we is there escalate? a risk of escalation? Yeah. Is what there are the risk escalation of escalation dynamics? Escalation, exactly. And how is that different to a Ukraine-style scenario or a Baltic-style scenario? Um, and exactly as you say, is a China on the Korean Peninsula scenario fundamentally different to um, an incursion in the South China Sea-style scenario? I mean, we can get very caught up in kind of focusing on the countries themselves and the threats that they may or may not pose and we can list off the different capabilities that they have and kind of draw lists of like arsenals and compare very crudely kind of what could we use to fight against their most sophisticated systems but actually where the strategic level tends to come in is the how are we choosing to fight where are we choosing to fight on what issues are we choosing to confront ourselves is this a trade war is this an economically based confrontation is this something that even has a military edge to it um, is this a war over international law and principles of, of um, global norms and governance? And how does that change yeah. the way that we might well, think about And when you do that, spaces? what you're describing, like in what Tina was saying about focusing on the aims and, and thinking at the highest level you can, right? Like like the, the ultimate goal of, you know, we'll just continue with the China, South China Sea example. Like what is it that they're really trying to achieve in, you know, preventing U.S. vessels from entering the South China Sea or, or the nine dash line, right, that they talk about. So um, when you operate at that level, you start to find opportunities for strategic innovation, right, to change the the basis of the conflict, right, to elevate the conflict so that you're not, you're not simply saying to the Chinese, well, we're going to put some aircraft carriers in there and you guys try to blow them up. But in fact, you, you recognize now that you have an op- option or a set of options that don't require that, that, that allow you to exercise your advantages in other fundamental ways. Like, like we have friends and they don't, right? As a sort of fundamental observation of pulling the conflict yeah. up to a higher level. I mean, the example I often give to the students is Germany in both world wars at sea, where in both world wars, they had this notion of challenging the British Navy on the surface, and they realized pretty quickly that they weren't going to be able to do that successfully. And at the same time, they understood that the Royal Navy is awesome and everything and had this great history, but they should Germany, as a central power, should not really worry much about the fact that the Royal Navy had freedom of navigation. What the Germans should worry about is isolating the British economy. Because they're dependent. That's right. Through sort of unrestricted submarine warfare. And they did it twice and they were very effective, although, you know, it wasn't decisive. But they were very effective, you know, in in changing. It was like they elevated the naval strategy beyond, you know, this isn't actually a naval conflict. It's it's about economic conflict. And then and then in that same innovative space, the allies respond Right. And they come up with ways to counter German strategy that are effective and within six months make unrestricted submarine warfare ineffective. Ineffective. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's this there's this constant back um, sort of back and forth between um, strategic actors. Right. Which is none of this is happening in a vacuum. Um, When I was at the Air War College, we had an end of year exercise and. One of the one of the goals was for them to do a sort of campaign design against a, a major adversary. And the problem by the end of the of the war college year, which I think was a testament to how well we had done our jobs, was that the students were constantly looking for ways other than starting a war to accomplish the objectives. And so by the end, in order to get them to fight a war, which we also needed them to demonstrate, some proficiency in in doing and planning we had to make this scenario so absurd um that it was it was almost entirely sort of unfathomable in order to get our u.s military students to do war planning to do war planning yeah um, because they were constantly looking for off-ramps allies diplomatic economic political sort of socio-cultural solutions and so the the war fighters were really some in some ways unhappy with the the people in the other departments and here i want to make a link into uh the discussion we're having with ethics and there's an author uh james murphy he's a philosopher who wrote a book a war's ends where his big insistence is that to be ethical is to be practically minded that means you need to understand as a military professional what is the realm of the possible whether it's negotiations and finding where you can innovate 
whether it's uh, how dynamics of war play out in contemporary environments, whether it's understanding the theory of war. So I think that uh, we're not in the habit of, of thinking about ethics in that way, that, that it, it combines a practical mindedness along with doing the right thing. Yeah. And I think, you know, this actually gets us back sort of full circle to where we started, which was, is this distinction that we sometimes make between the nature of war and the character of war a useful one? That was the sort of first question that I asked. And I think sometimes it's easy to get in a classroom and to have these theoretical discussions. And you can go on all day about this particular distinction and trying to figure it out. But for me, the real implication is why does it matter? What is uh, the significance of the things that change and the things that stay the same? And why does that matter at the strategic level? Why does it matter for our students, for policymakers, for for four-star general officers? Um, And I think those are questions that we must ask ethically, morally, professionally. I think those are conversations worth having. So it's not it's not that I want to get rid of the distinction entirely. I want to interrogate You won't. It. We well we won't, right? You like, will not succeed in doing that, even if it's worthwhile. It will be it will be persistent and so we ought to ask the follow up question, which is why is this distinction a useful one and what are the implications of it for for strategists? You guys came in today when it was dangerous, treacherous to record this podcast. Thank you very much for coming in and, and doing that. Jackie, yeah, pleasure. Always, always a pleasure. Emily Knowles, thank you very much for joining us in A Better Piece, the War Room Podcast, and Colonel Tino Perez, thank you for joining us. All right, well, we hope you will join us again on A Better Piece, the War Room Podcast. Thank you very much. Have a great day. If you've enjoyed this podcast and want to hear even more great content, subscribe to A Better Piece, the War Room Podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.